I'm not a morning person. Dedicated to being passionate about it. Bodybuilders have become more lazy. People have always thought I lift fake weights. Iran and the United States. You take, you take responsibility for that. Hey, Samir, how are you doing? Hi, Vlad, how are you? It's good to see you. How you been? Doing good. Good to see you too. It's great to see you. I remember we only like hung out one time. It was like years ago. We were shooting at Gold's Gym. Do you remember? For the Generation Iron. Oh my first God, that, that's quite a bit ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How's things? How's everything going? It's going very well. I appreciate you doing the interview today. I was looking forward to it. My pleasure, man. Um, you know, I know, Vlad, you're doing great now. I turn in Netflix and I see you everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> try, man. Try. Great job. Great job. Try. Thank you so much, man. Well, first of all, you know, I have, I have a lot of respect for you. you. You're one of the bodybuilders that I always admire. Thank you. appreciate that. I want to get to know a little bit more about your story. How did you get into bodybuilding originally? Well, what, what motivated you to be a bodybuilder? Well, yeah, just like everyone else, I picked up a magazine overseas. You know, I'm from Lebanon originally, as you know. And, uh, you know, as a volleyball player, soccer player, and, and then when I saw a magazine, you know, I picked up an American magazine in downtown Beirut, and, and, and Arnold was on the cover. <laughs> you know, between Arnold and Joe Weider, you know, I, I got really into it. And I did good at the local level in Lebanon. I went in school. I, I was doing Olympic lifting in the very beginning. But, you know, and then, then I developed that deep desire. You know, you develop the deep desire. That's all, you know, I, I think when you are very passionate and, you know, you know yourself if, you, if there's something you want to do. So bodybuilding became my life since uh, 1972 and up to, until today. That's amazing. Yeah. What was was bodybuilding, like in those times in Lebanon, right? How people looked at bodybuilding? Did they accept it? Were they kind oh, of you know, uh, the man that got me started, actually, he was the vice president of the IFBB. His name, Mali Halaywan. His gym was like the Vince Gironda kind of gym in Lebanon. Really hardcore. And it's wonderful when you work under the supervision of someone who has been there, done that. So he was a champion himself, really old school. You know, they look at bodybuilding as an art form. And, and I think this is the way it should be. For, ever since then, I start, this is what I tell people, you have to start on the right path from the very beginning if you want to go far, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It doesn't mean, oh, I don't want you to become champion quick. Go by all means, but you know you you have to do it properly. You know, you know there's a million way to go, but it's smart to pick up the proper way, which is you know do it through health and through art and you know you no know, bodybuilding nowadays, Vlad, as you see it, it's more like focus on mass, 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 which is I don't have a problem with mass. But mass has to come with class. Wow. You know, if the idea. body is massive and it's not pretty, what do you what we're doing? <laughs> you know, and no bodybuilder should ever accept the problem that we are having today. In the past 15 years, you know, things went out of hand and, and people got big at all costs. I am I'm I'm very motivated type of guy and, and I encourage people to discover. But sometimes some discovery isn't really always good for you. So, you know, if it's not broken, why fix it? But if it's broken, we need to fix it. And really I talk about that with everyone and I really love the sport and I my intention is to help. It's not about me, me, me. I really love the sport and I love to see, you know, I, you appreciate when you look at body like Arnold, Oliva, Zane, they represented art, even Steve Reeves. I mean, look at Steve Reeves is one of the most famous next to Arnold, but he wasn't the biggest guy in the world, but everybody still talked positively about Reeves, right? I'm sure you respect guy like Reeves yourself. You're, you're part of the gold era of bodybuilding, right? Gold era is the Arnold era, your era, uh, Frank Zane yeah. era, all these guys, right? Um, which people look at this era as the most aesthetically pleasing era, right? Would you agree? Well, uh, you know, you cannot ignore the past. 
you have to learn from the past. But the future and the new discovery, it's good. But we need to look at what's really good. And sometime along the way, we will come across something which is not necessarily good. So we'll have to, we need people out there to really be truthful and tell the kids this is not right. And, you know, I'm not trying to be uh, selfish in this year. I'm trying to really educate people and tell them, look, you don't want to be a champion and die when you are 30 or 40 by crossing the line into the danger zone. You know, when you see a man like Bill Pearl and Arnold and Zane, you know, Bill Pearl is 91 years old. And he's still got his mind. He's still healthy. He lives in Oregon. He still works out. He's 91 years old. And really, he represented art. You know, as you know, like Bill Pearl, he helped guys like Chris Dickerson, Dennis Tenorino, Boyer Cole. And actually took some advice from Bill Pearl myself when I came out to California back in, in the late 78, approximately, yeah. No, you know, bodybuilding in general, right? Um, the way it's the way it is, I mean, the way I see it right now, pro, I'm talking about pro bodybuilding, not not fitness, but pro bodybuilding is an extreme sport. Uh, many people see it as such because you take your body through extremes in order yeah. to look the way they look on stage, right? Now, in a golden era, you, you didn't see it as an extreme sport when you were doing it? Did you, did you know you were doing an extreme sport or was it different back then? Well, I mean, the workout was always hard. I mean, you can't say a guy like Arnold didn't train hard. Of course, we have guys now that train super hard. You know, you, you have guys like Ron Coleman, amazing. Uh, Dorian Yates trained super hard. You know, back in then, you have guys, uh, they, you know, we train super hard, but I think we kind of engage more in the art of bodybuilding. I don't see that today, uh, Vlad. I really don't see people focusing or putting much more emphasis on the, the beauty of the body. I have a problem with size. Size is okay. And if someone tell me Sergio Oliva is not big enough, I'll tell them something's wrong with them. <laughs> <laughs> Sergio was huge. Arnold was huge. And, you know, they always kept that middle. The midsection is tight. You know, nowadays, Vlad, with all due respect, which is I honestly see that some of those guys have about 20, 15, 20 pounds of visceral fat in the intestine, which is not right. And what caused that? That's another topic, which is, I don't want to talk about the technicality, but there are things that need to be adjusted. Because I know some of those guys are passionate. The, the, the problem is we have far too many people bogusing. When I use the term bogusing, but they try to do something, they're not from within, they're not belong. You know, if you want your athlete to be good, you, at the same time, try to show them some health also and try to, try to show them health and, and beauty and art at the same time. All, all should be done simultaneously. So, you know, Vlad, right now you see these guys are huge. And yes, they get ripped. But you get ripped, but make sure we want this to be clean right here. If you ignore the middle, it's not pretty. So we have to focus on the middle too. So what it sounds to me like you're saying is in your, in your opinion, bodybuilding decline in quality? Uh, the quality overall, but sometimes what's, what's going on today, some people come in with quality, but they have some area. Uh, let me give you an example. Frank Zane won the Miss Olympia three times. He wasn't the most massive, but if you look at Frank, his abdominal, his oblique and upper thighs were separated and lean and tight. And then, um, you know, we can say the same about Arnold, always have a tight middle. You know, um, it wouldn't hurt having guys. I mean, look, let's put it this way. When Ron Coleman won the Olympia, like around 2000, 2001, wow, he was like shredded, huge, and... He was, he was right, but sometimes 
some of the thing, um, you know, it's just, I don't know what to say. I don't want to really point finger at these guys are not great. No, I don't. I mean, I respect them all from Steve Reeves to Bill Pearl to Arnold to Coleman Yates. They all have a great intention. But sometimes the method should be looked at and modified <laughs> and see what is what's wrong. You know, you want to have 22, 23 inch arms, do it by all means. But try to keep that waist around 30, 31. That's fine. Depends on how big you are overall. You know, quality and size, beautiful. But also, we have to look at the overall pictures. Let me give you an example. Phil Heath, he won the Olympia, what, seven or eight? Seven. Seven, seven times. Seven times. I mean, look, Phil Heath, the first three, four years, wow, unbelievable. Then something went wrong in the middle. He had an injury. But, you know, I think he lost his his beauty once he started to get super massive. Sometimes it's not about size. He has all the size in the world, you know. Same thing with Flex Wheeler. You know, Flex, it was imminent that he would win the Olympia. Seriously. And I, I was a friend with Flex. I saw him at Gold Gym ever since he got started. I've been around all these guys. You know. And, you know, it's a shame that if Flex slowed down a little bit, he would have been Mr. Olympia, no doubt. Because he had that tiny waist, that deep separation. Flex was a great bodybuilder. You know, and I just hate to see a guy like Flex didn't win the Olympia. It just, it's very unfortunate. It should have been. Instead of driving 110 on the freeway, go about 70. That's okay. <laughs> Sometimes you're taking some risk when you go 120 miles an hour. As a pro bodybuilder, right? Um, do you think, because obviously a lot of people think of bodybuilding as a healthy lifestyle, right? But when you're competing, right? When you have to cut, you know, cut uh, water, cut the way. I mean, it's, 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 it's very enduring on your body, right? When you were doing it, like you knew that you were also doing something not necessarily healthy, but you were doing it to compete at the highest level, right? I agree with you. I agree with you. Part of bodybuilding can be unhealthy. Can be. But also, you can be healthy, but during the dehydration period, you may put a little pressure on your body by, you know, play with electrolyte a little bit to, to dry up. This is, for, from my perspective, this is the only really unhealthy part when you dehydrate and force your adrenal and all these things. But you can actually become a great champion without really endangering your health. And we're just speaking about Bill Pearl. He's 91 years old. He won the NABA Universe Professional Amateur. And he's like, great. Look at Arnold is still with us. Thank God. Wish him long life. Frank Zane is still with us. But the way things are going right now, Vlad, you know, and I wish all of them a long life, but I think it's really heavily destructive. So, you know, my, my saying is, it's okay to drink a glass of wine or two. But these guys are getting drunk all the time. You know, you can't do that. You can't have your cake and eat it. Did I go to endangering my health? You know what, Vladi? Uh, at some point where, you know, I was forcing my body fat to go. When I won, I was at probably, I went below 2%. It is not necessary to go that long. But the dehydration part, where you have to cut your sodium and lose all the subcutaneous fluid, you put kind of pressure on your uh, adrenal a little bit. And, and it's, yeah, it's not healthy. We can't deny that. So, but could it be done healthy? Could it be healthy? Yeah, it could. And I really believe you could be Mr. Olympia and stay very healthy. You could. Now, even today? I think even today, even today, you know, I mean, like I said, drink two glasses of wine, three glasses of wine, you will live. I know a lot of people drink three, four glasses of wine, but those that get drunk all the time, they could actually screw up eventually. You put too much day after day, pressure, pressure, pressure. As you can see, most of the guys have problems, either, you know, 
most of the champion have some problem, but if you look at the old schooler, they less, they have a lot less problem. I'm not taking side, but I'm talking about the health aspect here. You know what I mean? Don't think I would never disrespect guys like Coleman or Yates or Heath. Not at all. But I really would love to see the game to be on the healthy side. You know, so that doesn't mean don't drink alcohol at all. Drink, you can drink a little bit because <laughs> right, right, right. it's just, uh, oh, I, I tell you, nowadays I coach some people when they come to me and then they tell me what they're doing. And I'm like, oh, my God, what the hell are you doing? So some of the thing is being done right now. It's really not healthy, uh, Vladi. What are some of the shocking things that you hear they do that's, that shocks you? I have a guy who told me the what they, several guys they told me what they are using they they didn't really do well with their coaches but they start having health issue and when I found out what they take oh my god it's too much like substance you're talking about they're taking substances that's, forget that's... about the wine these guys drinking bottle of vodka <laughs> and whiskey <laughs> you know this is the difference this is the difference. I mean, for me, I rather drive to New York and take three days, four days, instead of rushing, be there and one day get in an accident. This is my idea. Just be patient. Gaining seven, eight pounds of pure muscle a year, it's plenty of muscle. But it, Mr. Olympia cannot happen in one and two years. It's going to take time to reach that level. But it's just like, you gotta be do it. You have to do it safely. There's other issue in bodybuilding. You know, right now, I don't mind for people to make money, but you know what? You need to be honest about what you're doing, and you need to always look at promoting the sport and the health being of the athlete. And you know, I, I don't tell people, "Hey, don't do." No, if you want to take what you want to drink vodka, just do it, but don't come on the stage pregnant don't come to the stage looking pregnant because this is the look that undesirable and people start to notice so we have guys like mr manion right now and they decided to to do the classic part and you know the 212 because really people got tired of that overall mass without class i did too <laughs> i still enjoy looking at arnold photos and he was my hero, I wanted to tell you. Arnold is my hero. And and I still look at his photo, and Arnold represented his body nicely. You could see one bad picture of Arnold. He doesn't. He, he, he did the right thing. And look at Zane. Look at his many beautiful body out there. But in the past two decades, we start to see people pushing, pushing it too far. Too far, and it's backfiring. You know, if you tell people to train, yeah, train your butt off, kill yourself in the gym, but enjoy it, relax, don't abuse. The abuse is part of the problem too. And my, what do you think, Vlad? I, I'm, I'm, I want to ask your opinion. Are you okay with some of the things that's been happening in the past two decades? Well, you know, my opinion is it's it's not as valuable as yours because I'm not in the sport no, no, I mean, you, you, you're the competitor so you, you know you, you know your stuff i mean i think ultimately you know samir it's like one of those things where you know people want to compete at the present time so they, they have to come they have to compete with the current you know the cur against the current guys and if they don't the come on the same level they, they're not going to be able to you know do it so it's it's a i hear you i hear you if you want to compete, you have to do ABC like everybody else. But from my perspective, you don't need to do the ABC like everyone else. I mean, you could do the A and B, but don't don't go to the point where it will backfire. You know, I'm not saying, oh, I'm an angel. I didn't take anything. No, I've done my thing. But I honestly always I was uh, I was conservative in. I socialized and I kept my contact with the best in the game. I, I worked with people that been there, done that. And then, of course, 
I always felt like applying the art of bodybuilding. I mean, you know, it's doable. It's doable. You can be Mr. Olympia without taking too far, without, without doing what's being done right now. Some of the things that's been done, Vladi, it's really crazy. Tell me about your journey to America and becoming a pro. What was it like coming to America? In, in, in the, you came here in the 70s, right? And uh, adjusting yes. to the life. And, I came uh, mid-70s to Michigan. What was, it, what was the journey like for you? It was a dream. Remember, when I picked up, listen, I, show, I tell you the connection. I picked up Muscle and Fitness, Mr. America, all the American magazine back in Lebanon. You know, Lebanon was Switzerland and Paris of the Middle East before all this mess. I heard, yeah. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. But the thing is, uh, so I looked at the magazine and said, what? Then I started noticing, you know, Joe Weider bringing Arnold here, bringing Franco, rest in peace, over here. You see guys coming in from all over the world and from all over the country to the Mecca of bodybuilding, which is where I am right now. And so it was, I was no different. I felt like I would love to be around Joe Weider. I would love to meet Joe. And you know what? Destiny. I met Joe and Joe was cool. Uh, when I was in Michigan, I competed in Mr. International. And Joe uh, offered me to come down to, Cal to California like everybody else. And, and quite frankly, it was like a dream come true. You know, back then, I saw Tom Platt in Michigan because Tom Platt was from Michigan. And Tom was telling me, like, Samir, I want to go to California. That's my dream. You know, Tom is a hardworking bodybuilder. He was Mr. Michigan the year before me. So I won the Mr. Michigan 1978 and boom, came down. So Platts came out here one month before me. So it was a dream. I came out here. It was really right in the nick of time. Late 78. I knew everyone. Joe Gold, the founder of Gold Gym, was really nice to me. And he welcomed me and he said, Samir, son, you didn't win Mr. International. But I think you should have won the overall. You were cheated. Joe Gold. Oh, my God. So it was like a great feeling. Joe Gold is one of the godfather, the man that started Gold Gym, where Arnold and Franco, Dave Draper, where everyone work out. Of course, you know that. So Joe, he said, Samir, you're welcome to my gym. You have a lifetime free membership. He gave me tons of clothing, training suits, Shirt and I was like, wow, or oh, like for me, like like a kid in a candy store. Oh, Joe Gold is giving me that. That's wonderful. Rest in peace. Joe was really passionate. He loved the game. And and I heard his remarks all the time. Oh, this guy, this, this guy, that. But you know, you have to respect those old timer because they've been there, done that. And I was around Zabo Kozowski, Ed Giuliani, the, the king of Muscle Beach back then. And then you hear all the story. And one of my close friends also, Art Zeller, who actually is, the, Art Zeller is the first man to see Arnold in America. He's the man that picked up Arnold in LAX. <laughs> so what, in Art Zeller became very close. I see him on a daily basis. I go to his house. Then I was passionate. I want to be around these people. I want to hear everything. <laughs> and so, one of the story that Art Zeller told me, he goes, Samir, the first thing is when I picked up Arnold in LAX, Arnold asked me, he said, Abby, what does it mean government? <laughs> you see what I mean? We all have to start somewhere. But I'm, I'm really, I, to me, sometimes I feel bad because when I came out here, all these guys were around. Now they're all gone. Most of them are gone. You know, it's just a sad thing about notice watching these people disappear right before your eyes. But I would like to carry on in their messages, in their footsteps, and really try my best to bring more awareness and help, really. It's not, to me, it's not about money. I love the game. I really do. And it's not about me, me, me. It's about us. I want the sport to really excel and be great. That you putting us now was Generation Iron. You're putting us on the map. You're making the sport beautiful. 
But we need people like you. We need people to help the sport. And we need positive people. So what was Arnold like when you met him? What was your, I, I keep hearing different stories about him back then in the 70s. Some people say he was very cocky. He was always just like, he wasn't you know, cocky. He, he wasn't cocky with me. He wasn't. But he knew I was here to, to do business. <laughs> and he knew that. And, and, you know, I took some advice from Arnold. No bullshit. You know, uh, Arnold, you know, Zamir, Zamir, I think you should, hey, Zamir, you should do. You know, he gave me some advice. You know, I took advice from Bill Pearl. I took advice from Joe Gold. I took advice from Frank Zane. So I was around these people. Frank Zane was living only a few blocks from me. I'd go to Frank's house and I bought even posing trunks at the time. Frank Zane gave me my posing trunk. Then I'd go out with Frank and Christine. And he, so, you know, I was around these people that really did bodybuilding the right way. So for me, you could see I'm still passionate. I would love to see things done properly. I love that. So I want to ask you about 1980, Mr. Olympia. Ooh. From what I understand, I was the most controversial and uh, infamous Mr. Olympia because of what happened with Arnold and him making a comeback suddenly. From, from your perspective, because you were there, right? You competed that year. Yeah, I was there. I was there. And I was around Arnold when he was doing his prep at World Gym. I saw him daily and I was really, wow, Arnold was really coming in strong. He was looking really, he looked better one month before the show. I saw him and I'm like, oh wow. Wait, so he knew um, he knew he was doing the show a month because from what I read, from what I read in the articles, that he the basically minute. he decided to make to do a show like the two days before. He didn't announce it, but I knew that. He didn't tell everyone out there that he, he wanted to surprise people, but I knew that. Joe Gold knew that. And so I'm training next to Arnold. He was training for the Conan movie, I believe, during that time. He was preparing uh, for the Conan movie, right? Was, I Something think like that. after Conan. After Conan? I don't recall. Let me see. 1980. I don't know what year was Conan. But no, Arnold really got back in shape really quick. I mean, but muscle memory. And I looked at him. I said, wow, there's no way he wants to look this good. There must be a reason, too. So that was his reason. And to be honest, although he's my hero, and will never lie about my what I saw. My eyes won't lie. I would never kiss ass to anyone. I will tell it like it is. You know, you know, only God is perfect. So you know what? Can Arnold make a mistake? Can he not look perfect like he always had? Yeah, I mean, things happen. And not too many people know that. But Arnold actually had a cortisone shot. He had a problem with his rotator cuff. And he had to take cortisone. So what happened, that cortisone really actually backfired a little bit in terms, you know, if you don't have that onion skin quality, it's not the same. So, you know, Arnold had a difficult time peaking like he normally does. And honestly, when I was backstage, 1980 Olympia, I, I was like, what? That's not the same guy that I really saw at World Gym. He wasn't the same. He was slightly off. That's Arnold, my hero, man. <laughs> you know, would I tell you he should have won? Should he won? From my perspective, he shouldn't. Even before the competition, from what I read, right, there was, there was people were pissed off, right, that he showed up at the competition. Uh, like, uh, they, Mike, they Mike a, Menser, uh, did Mike Menser start a fight with him at a press conference? Did that happen? Uh, I witnessed everything. I heard everything. It's all record, recorded here in my hard drive. You know, as you know, Arnold, he say things sometimes, and you know, he's he used a psychological factor against his competitor. So he did actually gave a couple of harsh statements to Mike when Mike got pissed off, and they got onto about to get the scuffle. I was there. Ken Waller was next to me, and uh, you know, Arnold made a comment. He said, "You know, Mike." Uh, what are you worried about? Look at how you let your belly hang on stage. And, you know, he told Mike something to piss him off because there was a complaint why they want to do it two different classes. So anyhow, to make the story short, they're about to really have physical fight. And everybody jump in the middle and stop it. That is the truth. But who instigate the fight, really? I think Arnold did. 
Arnold did. And, and a lot of people would like, oh, you know what? Arnold wants to do whatever he wants to do. So he didn't, he didn't like the idea that Arnold wants to make some changes, last minute changes. Is it true that he also attacked you, said something derogatory to you? Is that is that true or no, Arnold? Did he say something to said you? Said something derogatory to me? Yeah. At the press Never. conference? Never. Never. No, at the, fact, at, the press, at the press conference. I mean. No, I was actually, he was nice to me. He actually gave me, gave me five. And he was like, I have never had problems. Oh, that was a misinformation. Because I read in the article, he's, he was attacking like a lot of people, including you at the press conference. No, 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 no. Arnold, as is the, Arnold was, he felt that I could do an incredible job. And he felt that I was trying too hard. He actually told me, the mere, what are you doing? You, you should never be out of the money. The mirror, you have the body to win every show. He told me this. I, I'm not telling you any bit of bullshit here. Never. No, no, of course. So, so okay, okay, so we've uh, fast forward to the competition, right? The competition yeah. happens. From what I read, also, he was making a lot of comments on stage. He was like trying to throw people off when he was posing. Is that true? Have you heard something? Arnold always jokes around whether he was at the Naba Universe or at the Olympia. You know, that's his personality. Whether he's doing it to psychologically piss someone out or he did it as being Arnold, the funny guy, <laughs> you could, uh, but I, being around Arnold, I know he's funny. He could get away with anything, but it doesn't look like he's doing it to irritate you. Some, some people may get irritated. You know, I'm sure Mike Mensa, rest in peace, was irritated. And he told him, I said, Mike, you come into the show. You were pregnant. You let your stomach hang, and you know that Mike Messer got pissed off. He's, when you have a low body fat and you're being there, you you get pissed off. I have been pissed off several times, but you know, you know, you get on edge when you with low body fat. So I read that when Arnold won, they gave him the title, right? People got really pissed off. I heard that Frank Zane threw his trophy down. Uh, Chris yeah. Dickerson storm of the stage. Um, I know what was, what was the atmosphere like at that time when, when Arnold won? Well. Yeah, of course, so many people got pissed off. And I honestly believe they have the right to get mad. I, I think something was done. Do I know exactly what happened? Why did Arnold win? Sometimes you have to remember. Arnold had a lot of fans. In his Arnold, everybody look up to Arnold. And so I hear that, you know, some of the judges love Arnold, love him. Uh, Arnold, they didn't really care about his condition that day. They voted for him as Arnold, and that's not right. You know, me personally, if my brother was on stage, doesn't deserve the win, I would not let him win. But some of the some of the judges acted, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't really right what what was done. Uh, you know, Arnold, in my opinion, should not have been Mr. Olympia in 1980. Interesting. Um, and I also heard that from the article that people were booing also, and that CBS canceled the to the airing of the of the of the show. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And you know, knowing me as the kid back then, Samir, who's backstage, I knew I wasn't prepared in Australia. I overdid it. I tried too hard. But honestly, I was rooting for Arnold. <laughs> you know, I was rooting for Arnold. I would want Arnold. He's my hero. I want him to win. But he didn't deserve to win. That's the truth. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's it's really cool that you were there because you know I, I read so much about this Olympia from different sources, but you like you were there. That's, that's you know that's that's cool. Like you can tell me exactly what you know. What happened. I, I'm telling you the truth. Nothing but the truth, buddy. I have no reason. I mean, I like I said, I would I would want to see Arnold win because my hero, Mike Mintz is my friend too. Mike looked good. He was in good shape. Frank Zane looked pretty good. Dickerson looked good. I mean, the top five were really good. Can you tell me about Mike Menser? Because, you know, uh, that's one of the guys that, you know, I know he passed away already, obviously. And he's one of those bodybuilders that I feel like a lot of people don't have enough knowledge about. You know what I mean? The new generation, especially. Um, talk about Mike and what he meant for bodybuilding. Mike is a very intelligent man. It's very, very passionate. Uh, it's very unfortunate that toward the end of his career, and, and I think that Australia, Australia experience at the Mr. Olympia 1980, it stayed in him, stayed in him and bothered him for so long. And, and I was around him. In fact, Mike was around me and I remained friendly. He saw me winning the 83 Olympia. 
he was there and I wanted professional, so he was there. He was very supportive. But I know that stayed with him and bothered him for the longest time. He could have recovered from it. He should have like, forget it, it's done, block it and move forward. That's the only thing really I feel bad that Mike didn't recover from that experience in, in Sydney, Australia. Yeah, it's very sad. But Mike, Mike is a, a guy who wants to win badly. He's, I was around him and I saw how intense he was. He wanted to win so bad. I would go on a bike ride with him. And, uh, you know, his mentality is like he would do whatever it takes. I mean, I was with Mike doing a bike ride. I see him like I'm like trying and he's like gone. What the hell? I was like going crazy. <laughs> Mike told me a statement that was crazy. He said, you know what, Samir? He he didn't mean it to as a as a bad guy. He said, Samir, I would love to see that big jumbo jet explode over my head. We were we were bike riding near LAX kind of on the bike route. And you know, you see all these jumbo jets fly over our head. He said, dude, I want that. Mike was really focused. And he looked good. He really looked good. But he, he should have uh, not taken out on himself. You know, because he and Zane and Boyer and everybody else got robbed, obviously. But, you know, it is what it is. But now, now some people pointing finger don't. This is not a concrete statement I'm going to make. People telling me that Paul Graham, Paul Graham, who orchestrated something, he was the promoter of the show. And Paul Graham was a friend of Arnold. I mean, Arnold probably, I'm sure Arnold didn't fix it for himself, but I think Paul Graham did something to help Arnold. You know, I, you know, Arnold is a champion. Nobody could say that Arnold couldn't win. If Arnold showed up one month prior to the Mr. Olympia, the way I saw him at World Gym, honestly, he would have won. He should, well, he won, but he would have, it would have been much easier for him. He would probably win deservingly. How much camaraderie was between bodybuilders back then? Because obviously you just described, like, you know, a pretty intense situation where there's a lot of internal fighting. But I keep hearing the golden age, everybody was friends, best friends. It was. Not... It, look, I think back then people were like more happier. And uh, yeah, we had camaraderie at, I recall going to the beach in Santa Monica, right behind World Gym, and it's like Mr. Olympia on the beach. I mean, you have no, no, no nonsense. I swear, I'll tell you the truth. I can name for you about fifteen bodybuilders of being on the beach together at the same time. I wish, I wish I had this with me back then to film it. <laughs> you know, we never go to the beach with camera and iPhone, but you know, you have guys on the beach at one time. Like, you know, you have. Uh, Chris Dickerson, uh, Tom Plath, Andreas Collin, Pete Grumkowski, Roger Callard, myself. And, you know, it's like Mr. Olympia on the beach. You have like about Serge Nebre used to go and hang out. So you could see guys walking like what? It's crazy. The beach is you never see like a Mr. Olympia contest. People like hanging out together. It was like, yes, camaraderie was good back then. And I don't really see it these days. I don't. Hey, Samir, were you around for the pumping iron filming when they did the pumping iron in 75? I came out here by exactly when it's wrapped up the filming of pumping iron. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was yes. wondering. I was wondering if you, you witnessed that. No, I didn't witness that. So in um, 1980, you got the 15th place at the Olympia. And then 16. 19 16. 16. Okay, I make 16. it worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But then 1983, you won the Mr. Olympia. How did you well, make that progress? I mean, there's only... I, I was trying too hard. So I could tell you why understanding what's moderation, you you know, more is less sometimes. More is less. So I was trying too hard. And what's funny, Frank Zane actually mentions that some of you are trying too hard. I didn't really understand. But at the time, I had some complication. It wasn't unhealth. It wasn't really that I was in bad health. But I would cut my sodium too early. And really, nobody wants to 
tell the kids, Samir, what to do at the time. They made me learn. I went through the trial and error. <laughs> so I would cut my sodium way too early and, and my body really needed. I'm a sodium kind of person. You put me on low sodium for two, three days, I'll look like hell. I need it. So it was a electrolyte imbalance. What happened when I cut my sodium for too, too early? And then I went and advocated myself about fluid and electrolyte management. And no, I know exactly what to do. What's funny, one time Joe Weider, Joe Weider himself, he goes, oh my God, Samir. <laughs> Joe goes, Samir, why don't you today take like a half a tablespoon of salt? And I'm like, what is he talking about, Joe, at the time? That was back in 81. So I realized that when your sodium intake is in place, your aldosterone level will drop. When you dehydrate for too long, your aldosterone, the hormone is capable of bringing the fluids from the intracellular to the subcutaneous as a God made us to protect ourselves. So the adrenal cortex releases this mineral corticoid as a protection to the body. So it wasn't like I'm unhealthy. In fact, I was healthy, but my body was doing whatever it takes to, uh, to protect me. But I later realized that I cannot cut my sodium too early. And if I cut it, I don't really need to cut it too sharply. And so that's a different, nobody, nobody believed that I trained like a madman for the 80 Olympia. And I trained super hard for the 81. But at the time, I was still studying myself. Then I realized exactly what needed to be done. So when I put it together in 82, which is in 82, many, many experts believe that I should have won in 82. I was actually more ripped in 82 than 83. You know, in 82, I was 186 pounds. My body fat measured at 2.2 one month before the Olympia. And then I'm sure it went below too. Is that necessary to be that low in body fat? It's not. But because my body was retaining fluid, sometimes you see subcutaneous fluid as fat. So people cannot differentiate. So you try harder. You try harder. So this is what, what's important is to understand, to listen to your body. If your body really craving salt, just keep your sodium intake normal. and You don't need to cut it. And I was to the point, Vlad, where I would eat trout instead of eating salmon, for example, or snapper. Because river, fish, well water, it has a lot less sodium. Like, for example, I would watch, I wouldn't eat a bit of celery. The celery is high in sodium. So I was so technical way ahead of time. So Mike Mensa, one of those guys that actually watched the sodium, for him it worked, for me it backfired. So we're not we're not exactly the same. Some individual a little different in this biochemistry. You know, uh, the basic stuff were the same, but some people can get away with eating high, high sodium. Some people can't. I'm one of those that I have to keep the sodium in. I only cut it like forty hours before. That's it. So you're basically saying you were more tedious and worked harder before you won the Olympia. When you won the Olympia, you were you were a little bit easy. Easier, I was training hard all the time, even in 80 and 81. I'm like, there's not one year that I didn't train hard. But the thing is, you have to create balance. So the whole thing is balance. You need to create balance. And, you know, one of the advice that Bill Pearl actually told me, and later I started to believe that statement, you have to listen to your body. The bottom line, listen to your body. You're hungry, eat. Just because you're coach told you eat six meal and you force yourself to do it that's not right i want to look at eating five meals a day i'm not saying all oh, six is wrong but the body adapts to what you do sometimes six is fine sometimes for me five was perfect i didn't really need to eat more but at times when i'm hungry okay let's say i'm hungry at 10 o'clock at night that's fine i'll do like three whole eggs and I have like a little bit of a piece of cucumber. I understand how to keep my body alkaline by keeping the green. And 
you know, small things you learn along the, the way. And so I'm telling you, bodybuilding can be very healthy. It can be healthy. It can, it probably won't be healthy in the final 72 hours where you have to force your body into more dry, dryness and dehydration. But it can be, it can be just fine. You know, checking your chemistry, checking your, your, uh, you know, your hormonal balance and your, you know, checking your red blood cell, all these necessary things for you to stay healthy, you check it. That's why I tell these guys, they should have a, a blood uh, test and checking the result maybe every uh, couple of months while you're doing this kind of prep. Sometimes your hemoglobin, which is, you have too much red blood cell that it cause problem, you know? And so, you know, Vlad, it's really, it's, it's learning throughout your life. You will always learn. And so, so from my perspective, yes, you can be Mr. Olympia without crossing the line into the danger zone. Now you won Mr. Olympia in, in 1983. Uh, winning Olympia is, is a is a very prestigious title, of course. There's been bodybuilders in history that dreamt of winning this title and, and never got right. it, you know. It's, and you got it. Um, that's it's incredible. The most prestigious title, and I honestly believe that I could have won Olympia more than once, more. But you know, I'm not. I'm not one of those guys. Cry baby. It is what it is. You know, I've got what I want. A lot of people felt my result in 84 was complete high, highway robbery. I was going to ask you, because you went from the first to uh, in 1983, and you went to the sixth place and then the following year, correct? That sixth oh, place oh. was not sixth place. That was, they took me from here and put me in sixth. <laughs> so what happened? Like You look at the video, you look at the video, you look at the picture. There's no way in hell. I was. It was between me and Ron Coleman. I mean, sorry, uh, Lee Haney. Lee Haney and I went just head to head in New York, and that's the truth. You know, it's funny. I I will send you the statement. One of the judges from '82 who voted voted for me for it. A few days ago, I woke up and I saw uh, on one of the links uh, on one of the threads. He said. In all honesty, Samir was the winner. In my opinion, he should have won the Mr. Olympia. And I made a huge mistake. In 84? In 82. So one of the judges gave me ninth on symmetry slide. <laughs> and that one judge now, 40 years later, is saying like, oh, Samir should have won. <laughs> but, you know, this is ridiculous. But you know me, I'm like, live and let live. It's done. What's done is done. But it's good to be truthful. In 84, I had some issue where it was done that it was done intentionally in 84. So what, 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 what happened in 84? It's a long story. Something happened. Uh, something bad happened, actually. But, uh, you know, I was a victim. Like you, you had an issue with somebody, basically? Or some kind of a pro like external problem? Well, you know, sometimes there is always some jealous people staying in the wing. And be careful with these jealous people. Be careful of these people here too nice to sometimes. <laughs> you know, Joe Weider, rest in peace, he really liked me like his son. And I love Joe. And I always respected him. And I always, my dream was to work with Joe. So people orchestrated stuff. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff happened where they made me argue with Joe. And when I had that argument, like baseball kind of argument, they turned it as a, a Samir who physically attacked Joe. And I swear to God, on the soul of my father, I never really touched Joe. I loved Joe like a father. So Joe Weeder was a victim, not by me. And I was a victim in the circumstance where we got in the argument. And, you know, it's a long story. It's a long story. No, no, I understand. I understand. Believe me, in 84... I was intentionally robbed. Yeah, because when I was doing research for this, I'm, I'm looking at it, you won 83, and then the next year you go to sixth place. I'm like, how does you know that add up? I, you know what it I mean? wasn't it that much. Blood. I'm telling you, I wasn't that far. I was just as good in 84. It was just as good. And in fact, I have people tell me congratulations backstage, the contestant. I'll say it. He's still with us. Tony Pearson told me congratulations backstage at the 84 Olympia. He said, you got it. 
several people. Lee Labrada was with me backstage. Lee Labrada was with me backstage. And he was just the beginner. And I took him backstage because he, he was like to get him motivated. You know, it is what it is, but the truth has to come out. I'm not afraid. What's done is done. I don't want that title back, but I want people to know the truth. So you are basically the victim of politics or circumstances uh, to a certain degree. Well, there's a couple of individual. I don't want to say their name. You don't, don't have to. You don't have to say. You don't have to say their name. A couple, a couple of people. They really were dirty, and those same people they cheated Joe Weider too later, <laughs> in another way. So I can tell you some really deep inside stuff. Some deep inside stuff. But it is what it is. But the average Joe out there don't know the truth. Okay, well, Vlade is in eighth place. You could be the winner. How the hell? Okay, you are in eighth place. You're stuck with your eighth place, and that's what the average Joe is going to believe. But that's not the truth. I know the truth. So it happened. You know, I mean, okay, well, they voted Arnold first, 1980. And here I am telling you, he's my hero. I really wanted him to win. 21? No, he shouldn't have. Sorry, Arnold. I love you, though. <laughs> okay, so I want to ask you, um, it seems like after your era, right, after your Mr. Olympia title, Lee Haney came in, right? And he was slightly bigger, right? And then awesome. came Dorian Yates. And then came Ronnie Coleman, right? So um, it seemed like the, that's when the size increase started happening. So which bodybuilder you think specifically was kind of like responsible for that you know what I mean? For the change, change of direction. But well, we were talking about that constantly. The Joe Gold at World Gym, we saw, you know, oh, you know, I was Mr. Olympia at the time. You know, some people showed me some displeasure about certain individual. You know, Dorian Yates looked great the first two, three years, the first couple of years. Then he really didn't look as good. Same thing with Phil Heath. Same thing with Ronnie Coleman. Ronnie Coleman looked great in the first few years, correct? I mean, he, he didn't look as good the following few years. You know, I, I'm telling you the truth. Um, I saw Ronnie Coleman in 2000, 2001. In fact, I went to his room and I looked like, oh, my God. I see Ferrigno on out leaving and he said, oh, my God, Samir, Samir, I've never seen anything like it. And then I was like, okay, I'll see what, what Lou is talking about. But yeah, really, Ron Coleman was the biggest human being I have ever saw. And he was shredded beyond recognition. He was really good that year. And he won easily. He won it hands down. That's when Ronnie Coleman was so freaky, separated, oh, and everything else. You know, this, you know, the first... I'm telling you, I think the, the problem with the modern body building is like, if you follow this route, you would look good a year or two, and then you're going to ruin it. The excessive mass later, it will come back to haunt you. In 2020 and 2021, there's constantly reports of somebody dying, uh, a bodybuilder dying in late 40s, 50s. In 2020? In 2020, there's been a lot of deaths, yeah. Um, I don't know if you heard about them, but basically like people dying at a relatively young age. Yeah, I mean, we know people dying all over. I've talked to coaches in Kuwait. I talked to coaches in Iraq, in Iran. A lot of kids are dying because they're doing some stuff which is really dangerous. <laughs> they are doing some stuff. Look, look, I can give you, I, ha I hate to say this like that, but let me just give you an example. You can give someone 10,000 milligrams of testosterone. They won't die. Nothing will happen. But give someone five to ten IU of insulin and not do what's necessary, you'll die. You'll die. And so some of those kids overseas, they are misinformed in some countries. They, they, they don't know better. They think you take insulin like you take 100 milligrams of decades once you see. So they say, okay, insulin, I'll take about once you see. <laughs> There's no way you could live on one cc. You can't. I don't care if you're Russian, eat 5,500 grams of sugar. <laughs> to, to, and those are crazy stuff that happen when bodybuilding. I really wish that the insulin, 
didn't get came to a bodybuilding the way it did, because I think this is what's really ruining bodybuilding. Well, you know, you know Milos, right? You know Milos. Yeah, I'm friends with Milos. Yeah. So Milos is the one that he takes full responsibility for kind of. I know who told Milos how to do this. <laughs> I the same guy that told Milos about it and told me and and honestly I I don't think it's the method is sound. Oh, okay, it's a it's a doctor. I'm gonna say his name. It's a doctor from Czechoslovakia, from Milos country. His name Ludek Nusek. He started this trend of insulin. So we know insulin works, but what's what's the consequences? There will be major side effects. I mean, Milos said it's okay, but I sincerely say it is not. Maybe it was okay for Milos. <laughs> is it fair to say, obviously in your opinion, that, that insulin now is a key part of modern bodybuilding? It's, you know, or not? It's a ruin for modern bodybuilding. It's a ruin for bodybuilding. You know, I mean, look, now you look at guys like Chris Bumstead. He come out, say, wasted, sharp, and tight and stuff. But those bigger guys that's using insulin on a regular basis, what happened? They may get lean in this area, but you are growing the visceral fat in the inner intestine. You, it's imminent that you will have the bulgy type of stomach after a year or two. It may work the first year, but later on, it's going to get worse and worse. Believe me. No, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not defending Milos at all. I think what Milos is trying to say and when I interview him, I asked him the same question. Yeah. And what he's saying is if you use it according to the proper ways, according to his ways or whatever ways, then it's safe. That's that's all I'm saying he's saying. I'm not trying to defend it at all. You know, I, I don't, I... No, I hear you. I hear you. And I heard Milos saying that. But Milos, why? Are these guys that take it instead look better than the guys in the, from the past? This is where it comes down. You know, I'm not trying to say, uh, you know, that this stuff doesn't work. But it may work for a year or two, but later it's going to damage and ruin that body, that beauty of the physique. You know, if, if it's done by a professional, someone who understands exactly what should be done with it. Like, for example, we know like HGH works for anti-aging. And you could read a book by Dallas Cloutry, who was a grow young with HGH. But it, he didn't say for people to take 10 IU. <laughs> so does insulin really need it in bodybuilding? This is what we need to talk about. Is it necessary? It's not. Why? Because it's going to cut your career very short. So the question is, why is it, why is it then the, in, you know, a key component now um, in allegedly in bodybuilding? I, you know, what's funny, I hear some coaches saying, they, they really, they are clear on insulin no more. No, it's no way. Because some coaches understand now that it's not the right thing to do. But Milos insists that insulin should stay. But why? When, when, you, when you train super hard and you deplete your body and when you go and eat high glycemic carbs after the workout, that should give you the same benefit, but your body will do it. Why do you have to take insulin on the outside? You know, when you're very active, when you train, train with high intensity, the body will react to high glycemic carbs the same way as you, you took insulin. But no, they want to take 10 and 15 IU and then eat tons of sugar and no tail line. But why do you want to eat that stuff? Why don't you just eat your rice and potato without doing that crap? And do bodybuilding for 10 more years instead of doing it for one more year. And then, you know, all the sickness, all the health problems start in the stomach. All the health issues that we have and people really start, people are dying because they, the problems start in the intestine. You are what you eat. Why do you want to eat poison? This is it. Bodybuilding was about health, you know. I mean, back in the days, we heard like guys e eating two dozen of eggs, whole eggs, and they did the keto diet. It worked. The only thing I'm against is e the excessive use of the hardcore supplement we're talking about. 
and really shouldn't have a place. And by the right now, people are doing insulin for dehydration. People, they are trying to invent, trying to introduce something is dangerous. It's not sound. It is not ethical. It's not good for you. It's not. I didn't complain about people using D-ball. <laughs> I didn't complain about people using whatever anabolic in moderation. Keep your body healthy. Come on. If you live long, as long as Bill Pearl, and, you know, by all means, this is what should be done. We don't want you to win and die. I have a, I have a question. How do you know the moderation? Like, I, I know it might, be it might be a stupid question, but how do you, what do you get the guidance from, you know? Okay, wait. Let me, let me explain what moderation is. First of all, we take anabolic before competition to reverse catabolic effect. So what happens? The body recovers faster. You have positive nitrogen retention. So yes, your body absorbs more protein and body actually develops. So instead of starting with, let's say, you know, I remember Sergio Oliva who didn't use anything other than Dianabol. And look at this moderation. Look at this guy was the big, one of the biggest ever. He trained hard. He didn't really complicate things. And, you know, Sergio wasn't a monster when it comes to using the stuff. You know, I, I don't want to name certain individuals. Some of the great, they actually told me what they, they had been doing, what they have done. And that's, yes, moderation is this. Is when you take something, you make sure you check your health, your blood level, and you see if there's any toxicity level, you know, if your liver enzyme are okay, your SGPT, SGOT are fine, then you're not abusing. Why should you abuse? If it's, if it's one and two okay, then may, you may go out to three, but why to go to 10 and 12? This is what, what I'm saying. It, it, it's this, it, the abuse I'm talking about. There's no need. There's no need. You know, yeah, people think that taking a whole bottle is going to work more. <laughs> this is the only thing. It's like moderation is like if you give someone four or 500 milligrams, let's say, of androgen, which is, let's say, male hormone testosterone. Why some of those guys want to take five and 6,000 or 10,000? Why? I mean, that's enough for T-Rex. So it's overkill. Well, I'm, ass I'm assuming they're getting directions from a coach of some sort. I'm assuming. Well, right? who is that coach? <laughs> that coach is not, a, is not an MD. He wants to impress you by making you look good really quick. But he should be concerned about your health. Say, you know what? Give me a blood test. Let me see your liver enzyme. Let me see your health. No, I disagree taking A, B, C. That's why some of the clients come to me and I really look about, look into helping them from the heart. If it's good for me from what I've done, it's more likely it's not that bad. I never really abuse the stuff. I never abuse the gear. Personally, I never have. In the first seven years of training, I never touched the gear. So Samir, um, you mentioned that in 1994, you had this issue at Olympia. So like, you know, they, got, they put you in sixth place. Yeah. So would you say you retired from bodybuilding prematurely because you knew that you couldn't you couldn't come back and win the title anymore? Was that was that like the reason why you retired? I have to admit, yeah, it was weighing on my head all the time. I felt like someone is there to get me because it happened again. And they did it for me in Montreal where I deserve to win. They get me out out of the top, win a circle. And it was bothering me. You know, when you train and your mind isn't comfortable, that's not good. That's why bodybuilding should be done with fun, no stress. Oh, they, they're not there to get me. Uh, you know, I was passionate. I want to compete more. But they did me wrong, really did me wrong. And so... Uh, did you, you know, try talking to Joe Weider directly about this situation? Did you try sitting down with him at all? Well, see, Joe, Joe doesn't judge the contest himself. And what's funny, people say, oh, we to fix the show. I don't think we to really fix the show. But I know some people from then who want to be a brown noser trying to say, oh, yeah, Samir's a dirty guy who grabbed Joe, did this and that, and let's cheat him. And they have the wrong information. You know, I, I talked to Lisa, 
was a Joe's daughter. And she said to me, not long ago, I said, Samir, my dad really loves you. I said, Lisa, I love your dad. I would go out. Joe Weeder would call me on Saturday when his offices were closed on Sunday. Samir, meet us at Gladstone. Samir, meet us at Child House. He knew I enjoyed this. He knew I love bodybuilding. There's no way in hell that Joe Weeder wouldn't be fair to me. But some people, like I'm saying, some people, in, they did very, they tried very hard to derail. They derailed me. They knew this kid from Lebanon. Is, he loved the game. And it was imminent that I'll do good. I'm not being arrogant. They did try very hard. Robert Kennedy himself, rest in peace, told me, Samir, I don't get it. But Robert Kennedy, before he passed away, he discovered what was the problem and who caused the problem and, and why things happened. He explained it to me. I mean, I would, would love to talk to you about it in private too. It's crazy. It's crazy. I, I am a victim. It's sad, though. It's sad that it happened to you, you know? It's, I had no it, idea. It's it, the first time hearing that. It is. I'm, I'm like a guy who has parked your car over there, and somebody put some heroin and coke in your car, and then the cops stop you. They set you up, and you can't tell them, this is not mine. They're not going to believe you. No, it's yours. So they set me up. See, I, I was set up, uh, Vlade. You know, I'm telling you. Joe and Ben Weeder, rest in peace, they're no longer with us. And I could say whatever. No, no, no. Joe wasn't bad at all. Rest in peace. He was nice and I respected him. But there was a major misunderstanding where people from within, the jealous people that caused this complication, I, would, I wouldn't even give a crap. I would say their name. <laughs> For God's sake. Uh, I'm passionate. I love this game. And I'm not a bad guy. I refuse when anyone says, Samir did this, hit this. And Joe, Bob, Bob Kennedy said, Samir, I don't believe it. You hit Joe. I said, Robert, I swear to God, I never touched Joe. Never touched him. I cussed him out. <laughs> I told him everything nasty in the book. But never touched him. It's like a baseball fight. And Joe himself would go out. Samir, I love you. Come back. And really, I wasn't going to even bother. But Joe was nice and he realized, Joe realized that what was wrong, it's not his fault, it's not my fault. And he didn't blame me, but... <laughs> wow, what a, what a story. That's, that's it's a crazy. long story. It's a long story. And, and so there's an inside stuff sometimes I don't really like to talk about. But, um, you know, I was around all these people about, uh, you know, but it is what it is now. And life goes on. I'm still here. And thank God for that. Well, listen, I mean, for all it's worth, you won the Olympia. You are the Mr. Olympia. I mean, you have that title, and that's, and that's a, you know, a great accomplishment. Only a few people have that, so you did it. Well, I'm happy to be part of the group that won the Olympia. It really means a lot to me. You know, I, I love to really see the sport continue to, uh, to excel and get better and better. And, and so my intention is really here to, to, to actually contribute to the sport I love in a positive way. I will never do anything destructive to hurt my sport. I have a great respect for everybody. You know, I mean, I'm not against Milos whatsoever, but maybe the method was that I don't agree with. Sometimes we agree to disagree. You know, you don't like broccoli. That's fine with me. You can eat your broccoli. <laughs> So if you was to compete today in, in 2021, would you pick um, classic uh, bodybuilding, classic physique, or would you pick men's open? Well, to me, it was all classic, and I'm surprised. Why? Because, you know, when I won the Olympia, I was 196. When Haney was 248, Bertel Fox was massive. So I won. So why couldn't it be happen now? Why couldn't a guy who's 200 pounds beat someone who's 250? So I think it's all classic. It's all classic. But then again, I think the MPC Pro League, they're doing their best to, to, to really bring back that classic look by picking up the 212. You know, the good thing was Jim Mannion. He was a bodybuilder himself. And so I, I just hope that, you know, they continue to, make the necessary changes and tell really uh, 
the kids to get wiser and understand and really even even posing right now not just it's a, there's a lot of things that need to be actually adjusted you know you can talk to a guy like frank zane and uh probably myself or plus we could actually contribute to why would the guy stand like this now bloody <laughs> it's just some of the thing it looks awkward and we talk about it out of love not out of hate <laughs> so and the judges need to also take part of that say you know what I, i'm helping a guy right now a young guy who's really really good and he understands and said you know it's it bother me when i see this you know you have to display what you have nicely and you know it's like you know people are learning from unqualified people i mean who would you want to learn from frank zane mohammed makawi or from some guys on instagram claiming that he is a coach posing coach master you know you're not proven to coach you need we need to have qualified people that really do it right and help the kids to show them what's right and to for the good of the sport is that why you started your venture uh, line bodybuilding talk about that company and yeah what, actually what, 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 explaining the whole the whole thing well line bodybuilding is really i have this burning desire because i have a lot of people asking me for coaching and stuff like that and so we started line bodybuilding for that one reason and then now we are connecting with uh MPC, local MPC, you know, with muscle contest. And I just did an interview for Brazil, for the MPC in Brazil. And then really uh, good when you see uh, a man in charge that's actually from within, that really cares. So, and I, I was telling like Tamar Aljundi, who is actually in charge in local and uh, locally here in Los Angeles. I said, Tamar, in my opinion, a promoter have the right to make a lot of money. That's fine. But it's okay to make 500000 instead of making 600000 But that 100000 additional, really, we need to turn people attention and repairing some of those issues. We need to care. So it's not all about money, money, money. It's about keeping the sport beautiful, keeping it, uh, you know, do your job as someone who loves the game. And that's where it happened. I really do care about the game. I'd love to see, I, I'm not going to win anything anymore, but I would love to see good things, uh, Vlade. You know, when I turn my TV now and I see, uh, you know, Generation Iron promoting the sport, and then, yeah, I turn my TV and then, wow, that's good. We need people to bring positive energy. We need people to, you know, to look at the sport in a good way. You know, it's good to honor guys that like Ron Coleman. I saw that what you done was Ronnie was great. I love Ronnie, <laughs> and and so uh, we need we need to promote the sport in a nice way. We need to uh, see. There's a there's a lot of things that can be talked about in detail. You know, the old school is not necessarily. Uh, I'm being biased by the old school. I'm not biased. I think we can do actually better now. We could. But we need to put folk, we need to focus on people that been there, done that, people with a lot of experience, you know. And uh, it's it's very important. Is, is Lion Bodybuilding, a, is it a coaching platform or is it a seminar? So what, what is it? And, uh, actually, we, we're going to do a workshop, help the athlete in posing. And actually, uh, sometimes we do a workshop, show exercise mechanic and stuff like that, overall coaching. And then I have uh, my partner, Jeff Milano, who is actually really passionate. I'm coaching Jeff, and Jeff did a great job as a bodybuilding champion himself. So he noticed the same thing, and we're on the same page. We are trying to do our job, but, you know, it's not about money. Again, we want to do the right thing. And, and then Jeff told me, he said, Generation Iron, I said, I love the time Generation Iron because, you know, they uh, care about the sport and, and we need to care a little bit more and we need to do a good job. That's it. We need to do a better job. <laughs>
So, Samir, last thing I want to ask you about Big Rami. So, Big Rami just won 2020 Mr. Olympia. Ronnie? Okay. Big Rami, yeah. He just won 2020. Mr. Wonderful Olympia. guy. I love Ronnie. I talk to Ronnie. You know, I'm talking Big Rami. Rami, not Ronnie. Yeah, yeah. Big Rami. Rami, Rami is a wonderful man, and he's passionate. Um, you know, he, he actually popped up this year. He came in and dried up properly several years back and and i see that he couldn't beat phil because something wasn't you know uh, i mean phil is not an easy man to beat when he's on let me tell you phil he is a badass when he's on <laughs> i've been honest you know and so i think uh big rami did a good job this year whatever he did it's his business but personally he won because his quality was on point. And uh, he had a good team on board helping him. You know, I don't know precisely what did he do, but he got the job done. And so, uh, you know, talking about the former Mr. Olympia winner. Um, Brennan Curry? Curry. Beautiful. Curry has a beautiful body. I felt if Curry improved a little bit more in the lower body, a little bit more, especially in the back part of his hamstring. And Curry has a beautiful physique. And his chances are excellent. But, he, you know, he, I'm sure he'll get back to the drawing board and come in more prepared for this coming Olympia. And Big Rami is massive. When someone is massive, he's got arms, shoulders. You know, I, I think Big Rami, was his coach, was saying, uh, I know Danny James was saying, they're going back to the old school way with Big Rami. When Rami was in Kuwait, he was trying very hard with the camel crew. And sometimes they weren't on the same page when he was speaking. I spoke with Rami, okay? And so... You know, the thing is, everybody wants to get the credit. Oh, I helped Rami. But come on, Rami is working very hard. All he needs is, is a minor tweak into his. He needed to pop. So when I said some of the things, sometimes the guys in Kuwait get mad at me. But, <laughs> you know, I'm just telling the truth. I really don't care who wins. Curry, uh, for example, Heidi Chopin, in my opinion, Heidi. Could have been Mr. Olympia the year before. Not to say that Curry wasn't. Curry is great. Curry is wide in small ways. And, you know, it's kind of uh, sometimes apple and orange, <laughs> oranges. Uh, but I voted this year for Big Rami simply because Rami came in full, dry. He looks healthier than his usual self. He's still the biggest guy on the stage, right? He, so the size, he, the, he oversizes everybody, outsizes everybody. So he won't, he has so much, he can afford it. I mean, he has so, so much mass. Big Rami, God bless him. Uh, the guy, I'm happy for him because he's really passionate, he wants to win. And I'm like, too bad you can't have two, three Mr. Olympia at the same time. You know, I, I'm impressed with that personality of Hadi Chopin. Hadi brings to the stage power in grace you could see his his vibrant and ready to win uh i felt curry needed to bring more more uh there's something there's something you must tweak a little bit he need to pop up a little bit more bring his legs slightly i think curry focused so much on his arm and shoulder and he's damn impressive i mean come on the guy's beyond big and the good things about curry he stayed wasted his waist stays small do you think Rami winning is basically uh, obviously he is a mass monster, right? It's still taking because you, you keep talking about you know the classic physique and a smaller guy, but do you think the Olympia is still going into the obviously you know the size? As long as I see, look at Rami didn't show a sign of a stomach last year, <laughs> he was good, and I didn't see that on Hadi Chopin, which is I see good things right now, so they're focusing on eliminating the problem. And let's hope it stays like that. Let's hope it stays pretty. 
like, you know, uh, I mean, look, I'm in favor of guys like Phil Heath when he's on. Wow. Phil's body is incredible. He flows really beautiful. I'm telling you, Phil Heath is one of the best Mr. Olympia that is. Why? Because, you know, he had it all. But his issue with his, uh, uh, whatever he had a problem, he had a hernia or whatever he did, whatever surgery he did, it backfired. Poor guy, he couldn't control his abs. And so he couldn't, he can't win like that. So couldn't control his abs. But still, I think if Phil Heath come in like he was three, four years ago, it's slam dunk, he'll win it. <laughs> but may the best man win, and I'm happy for Rami now. Samir, last thing I want to ask you is how do you feel about, do you feel like there's a movement happening from the Middle East right now, North Africa, a lot of great bodybuilders coming out from that region? Uh, obviously, you were, the, you were, you know, one of the first ones to come from Lebanon, but how do you feel about right now? It seems like this, I, and it's not just one country, it's different countries uh, in a region that are contributing yeah. great bodybuilders. You know what, a lot of great champions coming out of the Middle East, especially from Egypt, you know, I don't know what it is, maybe whatever they're eating naturally, it's, it's helping them. They have these guys really becoming pretty good. You know, I, I haven't really kept close eyes on Lebanon right now after all this. This year was a total mess for all of us, you know. But, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter where you're at. I mean, we have some great Russian athletes. We have some Italian. But this whole year was a total mess, and we really didn't see much. But I'm sure we're gonna see you at the Olympia this year, huh? Oh, we yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? What? Honestly, I know from your perspective, how did you see the top three at the last Olympia? I'm asking you. At the last 2020? Yes. Um. Well, you know, I definitely am a big fan of Phil Heath. You know, I feel like he always brings. I, I feel like he made a strong comeback. You know what I mean? I didn't and, know that you were a fan of Phil. Yeah, absolutely. I oh, feel like okay. I, I feel like he's I feel like he's one of the best, Mr. Olympias. Without a doubt. In my and, and, no, I got a chance to witness him compete. You know what I mean? So I, 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 I don't think Phil he's like me personally. Really? I Why? don't think I don't know, but I think he's one of the greatest. He's one of the greatest in my <laughs> I, opinion. Too. Listen, I don't care who, but I'm telling you the truth about what I believe in. You know, Phil Heath has one of the most really gifted body, and too bad he had the issue with the stomach. You know, let's hope Big Rami do well. Let's hope, uh, uh, you know, Curry would come in more, improve on the lower body. And let's hope the best men win. That's all we, we want, really. <laughs> and I'm all for that. Samir, thank you so much for your time. I'm a big fan of yours. Just want to let you know, you know, let's definitely do this again soon. Thank you, Vladi. It's a really a pleasure. I'm glad to see someone who cares about the sport is on the other side of this screen here. <laughs> So it was a pleasure talking to you, my friend. And I'm always here to contribute. Thank you so much, sir. Have a great day. Thank you.